College 2022. This is our fifth college, and we want to welcome you if you're watching by Facebook and all those that are here tonight. We're so pleased that you're here and that you have a hunger for God's Word and for the work of the Lord. And I want to just read one verse of Scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you tonight, Lord God, for the privilege of coming into your house and opening up your precious word. God, I pray tonight, Lord God, that you'll just open our hearts and our understanding. God, open up the, the eyes, God, and our ears, Lord, to hear and see, God, what you want us to know tonight. Teach us, God, your ways and your word, God, and teach us, Lord God, to how to be more effective in serving you and in ministry in every way, Father. And we'll give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Now, tonight, uh, there's a couple of things. If you're going to be a, a minister, you need a handkerchief. I'm being honest now. A pen. I'm giving you my, some breath mints. They work real nice, especially when you're praying for people. They'll never have you pray for them again if you kill them off the first time. But I want to say, you know, normally homiletics comes in the back of our, our book. And normally homiletics is the teaching of sermon preparation. Normally we would teach all the doctrines and all the other things first. And then homiletics would come after. But we have some ministers that are here that are ministering, and it's on-the-job training. They're, they're, they're preaching, they're pastoring, they're doing all those kinds of things. And we want to make sure we're going to do this first this time so that they have a little bit of an understanding of how to prepare a sermon, how to put a message together. But, you know, before I get into that tonight, I want to read 12 tips for preaching for you tonight. One, if you don't listen to other preachers, no one will listen to you. You need to learn to listen. I've watched preachers in meetings. They're in their Bible. They're doing a mini study. They're not paying attention to the preacher. Like They, they don't need to know. They don't need to learn. They already know it all, so they're not paying attention. Well, if, you know, you reap what you sow. If you don't pay attention to other people's preaching, then they're not going to pay attention to yours. It's the same way, listen, as a leader, it, people will only worship as much as you worship. If you come to church and you're not involved in worship and you don't think worship part of the service is important, then they're not going to think the worship part of the service is important either. So you're teaching by example. Everything we do, we teach by example. So I want to say that, you know, we need to listen to good preaching. We need to, you know, it's nothing wrong, and I want to share this, though, but make sure you know who you're listening to. Be careful. Just because somebody is popular or just because somebody is prominent or somebody is, uh, you know, flamboyant or they seem to really, you know, have a big following, that doesn't make them biblically sound or any good for your consumption. You got to know their belief. You got to know where what's behind all that. Know their doctrine because once you get indoctrinated wrong, it's hard to undo wrong teaching. Once you get it in your mind and you get it in your heart, and if people follow a wrong doctrine for a certain length of time, they don't want to back up and say they were wrong. It's hard to say, I've been following this guy for a year and he's a quack. You're better to ask somebody. You know, Stephen Furtick is a Baptist. He believes in one saved, always saved. He blasphemes the Holy Ghost and says it's, it's no good. It's, it's a joke. So people follow, and I'm only using him as an example, but they follow him because he's prominent and the music's popular and all that, but he's a quack. So don't follow him. So you need to know who you're following. If you follow these people, you're going to get in trouble. You need to get good preaching you need good teaching. Instead of watching garbage on the TV, you know, I'll put Reinhard Bunke on. I'll listen to him. I'll listen to Daniel Kalenda. I'll listen to uh, 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 Daniel Chan. Some of these guys that are out there 
on fire for God that are seeing results. Millions are being saved. People are being healed, raised from the dead. They got the fruit to back up what they're doing. They need to have the fruit of righteousness, and they should have the fruit of the supernatural in their ministry, or they're nothing to do with us. Amen? So be careful. You need good, solid teaching. But Jesus called the disciples to follow, not to lead. He said, follow me. He taught them to pray, not to preach. Because it's more important to be spiritually sound than it is to be scripturally sound. Your prayer life, your personal walk with God, your time of study of God's word, all of that is far more important than doctrine or notes or any of that. You have to have that walk with the Lord. You have to have that personal relationship. That's my second point. Your spirit is more important than your sermon. Your spiritual man is more important than your sermon. If your spiritual man ain't tuned in with God, if you're not hidden prayer and you're not, you know, living a life above reproach and trying to live a godly life, your life is only going to be as strong, your ministry, as the life behind what you live. People will look, they know everybody. They know if you're a joke or not. They know, well, you can, you know, you can teach a bird to talk. But you got to have the spiritual walk, and you got to be prepared. You know, a lot of my messages, people ask, how long it take you to prepare a message? Some of my best messages were prepared quickly. But I was spiritually prepared for 37 years. It was part of my life, part of my fabric. Every day I wake up, when I open my eyes, I open God's Word. Every day when I get in that car, I pray for one hour. And I want you to know it's your life that is more important than your polished notes. It's your spiritual man. Your heart, when you speak out of the abundance of your heart, your heart will touch people. They know if it's from your heart or not. If it's just from a polished note, then they're not going to receive that. People know. But if it's from your heart, we need to work more on our spirit than we do on our notes. Can you say amen? Thirdly, microwave messages won't change lives. What do you mean by that? There's microwave and there's oven messages. A message that is in your heart that you have from God that you feel compelled to minister, if you let that bake in there, let it work on you. Wrestle with it. Allow it to become a part of your life. Be, be, be real about it. Study on it. Read books about it. Read a track about it. And it'll become something that will change lives. It won't just impress people, but it will impact people. Can you say amen? Be practical. Jesus was practical. But I'm going to tell you something about Jesus. He preached a, preached a practical message, very simple. Reinhard Bunke was very simple, not what you'd call a big, flashy preacher. But, you know, he did what Jesus did. After he preached his simple message, he demonstrated with signs and wonders. See, that's, a, that's, that's what a life hidden Christ will develop. Signs and wonders will follow your ministry because here we are, you know, you can preach a practical message, but you can demonstrate with power in the Holy Ghost. We need the Holy Spirit to guide us, and we need to make place. I'm going to share, I'm going to teach you about sermon preparation, but I want to make this point tonight before we do. Always make room for the Holy Ghost. Never be chained to your notes that the Holy Ghost can't have his way. Never be bound to your notes. Know your outline. Know the main points and make room for the Holy Ghost. If God anoints a portion of it, don't try to move on to another place. God's dealing here. Stay there. Let the Holy Ghost lead you. And I want to share something else with you. It's okay to use other people's sermons. Just don't make a habit of it. You know what I mean? If it makes you lazy and you don't study no more, then you're missing the point. It's okay to preach somebody else's message. It's okay to re-preach your message in a new light 
with a new revelation in a different way, God will give it to you. And I'm going to tell you something about preaching. Your message that you preach now, five years from now, you'll preach that same message with more revelation, way more knowledge, way more anointing, because it'll grow in your spirit. You'll see more. You'll, you'll pick up more in the scripture. You'll, 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 you'll understand more than you did before. I look back at my notes from 30 years ago, and they were so basic. I wonder how in the world the people ever put up with me, you know, because we just, we have to start somewhere. But know this, that Jesus also used stories. Number six. You know, a good illustration is worth its weight in gold. I'm going to say something to you tonight. When I first started preaching, I bought every illustration book they had in the Christian bookstore. Every one. And the biggest down, uh, downer for me, one time I got weak and I had a friend that was struggling with illustrations. And I had the best illustration book in the world. It was called 7700 Amazing Sermon Illustrations. It was that thick. That was just one of about ten that I had. But and the stories in there were just amazing. It was amazing. And a friend of mine said, man, where do you get all them stories? And I handed it to him. And I thought, I could always go get another copy. Not anymore, you can't. <laughs> it's not out there. But buy up sermon illustration books because when you're young in the ministry, you need illustrations. Jesus used illustrations. He talked about, you know, sowing the seed. You know, he talked about stories, you know, and, and we need illustrations that will drive the point home, things that will make it alive, that will that'll show the people what we're talking about. Seven, know your material. Practice it. Jimmy Swaggart, I read his book one time, To Cross a River. He used to go out and preach to the tree stump when he was practicing. He'd go out in the woods and preach. Practice your stuff in your mind. Roll it over in your mind. Let it, and I'm going to share something else with you. This is from Ham Parker, chapter 1, verse 1. Don't share your message with everybody because you leak out the freshness. And by the time you go to preach it, it's as dead as a doornail. Because you've already told it to everybody in the country and you've preached it 45 times. So let it bake in your spirit like an oven message and just roll it over in there. And don't, in fact, I've shared things with some people and they told me, a person told me one time, do not preach that message, whatever you do. And me being a thick head that I was, I preached it anyway. And that night, 25 souls got saved because God gave me the message. So you're better off not sharing it and not bouncing it off people because they'll get you off track. But just let it ferment in your spirit and don't be chained to your notes again, as I said. Eighthly, make your sermons noteworthy. We're going to talk about that tonight, and that's part of what we're going to get into. We're not going to be able to cover it all. But I, the basic structure of a sermon, it's an introduction, a body, and I prefer three points. If you ever hear the saying, three points like a sermon, that's a common saying. Three points like a sermon. So most sermons are three points. And you can have sub points and illustrations in between. And then lastly, the conclusion. And your, your introduction and your conclusion should never be different in size. And your introduction shouldn't be too long. I heard an old woman say one time, she said, I listen to my preacher, and he takes so long to set the table, by the time the table's set, I'm no longer hungry, because his, his introduction was too long. And so an introduction should introduce the subject. It should create a hunger or, or spark a interest in the people. If you have a good introduction, and I'll tell you something else that you won't get out of a book, because this is the 21st century. A good title. There's a lot to be said for a good title. I picked the titles when we was on the Facebook, when, we, when the churches were closed down, and I picked some good titles, and other ones did too. And some of them got 3,000 hits because of the title. You know, other ones, there's like 180 hits. But the title grabbed them. You know what I mean? Something relevant, you know, that was 
reached out and touched them. So your title is important because I'll tell you why. It'll grab their interest. Right off the bat, they're going to say, what are you going to get out of that? Where's he going with it? And then the same way with an introduction is it grabs their interest and it'll keep them interested long enough that you can share what you want to share with them. So we see here, make your sermons noteworthy, tweetable. Somebody should see something in your message that they like that they can tweet to somebody else, say, man, that was good. You know, you have to put some creativity into it. You can't be lazy. Listen, if you're going to be in the ministry, if you're lazy, you might as well pack it in now because this ain't no lazy man's job. This is study all the time, pray all the time, run all the time. It's just, it's constant, you know. And so the thing of it is, put some creativity, some thought into, you know, what you're going to talk about. Put some study into it. Listen, I've got, I brought some of these to show you. I got a Thompson's Chain Bible, right? You need one of those. I got a Dake's Bible. I know Dakes, he's off maybe in some things, but I, he's pretty good. He's a Pentecostal Bible. I've got seven or eight Bibles at home, all different Bibles, and when I'm looking at a text, some of them have commentary, some of them don't. I might open up, I got a Hebrew Bible in the Hebrew language. I'll open up seven Bibles when I'm trying to look at a text, and I know there's something here God's trying to show me, and I want to know what it is. So I'm, I'm going to every translation, then all of a sudden, it hits me. That's it. And so you need, you need good Bibles, you need good, con I have a strong concordance. But listen, I'm not good with the phone. Anything I got on here, my Richie put on here for me because I'm no good with a computer or anything like that. I have an iPad. The first one I told the kids, take it back. It's no good. I don't know how to work it. And then afterwards, they showed me how to work it, and I went and got another one. But so there's so much you can get today. My library was, I had the pulpit commentaries, like 30-some volumes, and then I had the preacher's homiletical commentary, 30-some volumes. They're back in that closet, in that computer room, still there. But nowadays, you can get on your computer and you can download Strong's Concordance that gives you the Greek or the Hebrew on every word in the Bible. Richard put an app on my phone called the Tetra Bible, Card, tet, what's it called? Takarta Bible. And I can touch one word on there. It'll give me the Greek or the Hebrew or the original context on that scripture. So there's so much you can do now to, to study. And so that you have a, if you don't know more than the people you're speaking to, you're not really going to help them. So you need to, and use illustrations, use creativity. I like Illustrated messages. I preach a message. I put an orange uh, highwayman coat on with the cones, and I preach a message called Blockades on the Road to Hell. God sends blockades to stop people from going to hell. You know, I seen Bill uh, Hicks preach a great message here one time. He had a bunch of stones in his hand, and he preached, you without sin cast the first stone. He walked around and handed them to people, and he was preaching an illustrated message. But there's, you can use your mind and you can be creative and those things will stick with people forever. Those little illustrations will stick with people forever. And let me say this here. Avoid parasites. What I call a parasite is something that you say over and over again habitually. I'm going to share this with you now. This, you're going to get something out of this. If you want to know where your faults and failures are as a preacher, as a teacher, watch yourself on Facebook. And you'll notice you got parasites. There's things you say that are annoying. Instead of anointing, they're annoying. You say it over and over again, and I do it. You know, like, give the Lord a hand clap. That's a parasite. You know what I mean? <laughs> you, don't, you don't need that. That's gooey commercial filling. It aggravates people. But I've tried to stop, and I've made up my mind. I'm not going to say that no more. But at least I'm saying something that's giving God glory. But avoid parasites, you know, and avoid talking about yourself. 
I is in the middle of sin. I is in the middle of pride. I is in the middle of Lucifer. The Bible says in the New Testament, we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ and him crucified. When you want to refer to something, learn to say the word we instead of I. We done this, and we done that, and we seen this, and we seen that. But try to avoid the word I and bring glory to God and correct the annoying things when you watch yourself on the Facebook. You know, if you really want to improve your preaching, if you really want to improve your teaching, watch yourself on the Facebook, and everything that aggravates you is aggravating them too. So stop doing it. But it's good. And listen, learn to take. Don't just take praise. I'm giving you this tonight, 12 points on being a better preacher. Don't, don't just take praise. Everybody wants to take praise. Great message. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I thought so. I was pretty good. You know what I mean? Everybody wants praise. But nobody wants criticism. Learn to take criticism. You criticize yourself when you watch the Facebook. And if other people come to you with criticism, let it help you. Chew up the meat and spit out the bones. Say, you know, thank you. I appreciate that. If somebody's trying to give you some instructions, don't be a hard head. Another thing, don't speak monotone. People that speak monotone all the time, they just bore people into tears. Your message should have highs and lows. If all you do is scream from the beginning to the end, that annoys them. If all you do is talk in a whisper the whole time, that's no good. When it calls for a shout on a point that deserves a shout, give it one. Sometimes you got to have the fire, and you got it's got to be in your eyes, it's got to be in your speech. You got to move faster. You got to you got to you got to be spontaneous. But if you if it's just a, a a quiet point, then use your normal voice. Your voice should be up and down, up and down, not monotone. Not high all the time, not low all the time. But I'm giving you some pointers now that you won't learn other places. Let now here also, dress modestly, not to impress, not trendy, not cool, not sexy. People don't need sexy. You know, I see these guys. And I'm not against working out, I mean, you know, but preachers I'm talking about now, with a shirt two times smaller than they really need, walking around, that ain't helping nobody. That's flesh. The Bible says we're to mortify the flesh. We're to crucify the flesh, not glorify the flesh. Amen? So it, people ain't impressed by your skinny red jeans or your shirt unbuttoned down to there with four or five chains. They're not impressed. That ain't going to help nobody. You need the anointing that destroys the yoke of bondage. Can you say amen in the name of Jesus? And all these guys on the TV that are dressed like that and doing like that, and these ladies that are dressed like that, they are carnal. And if you follow them, you're going to be carnal. And preaching is impartation. And if you get that imparted, that carnal ministry into you, you're going to impart carnal ministry to other people. If you follow holy people and if you follow righteous people that have the fruit of the Spirit and they have the fruit of the supernatural, you'll have all that same thing. You are what you eat. Whatever you take in is, what did the, what did the disciples say at the gate beautiful in Acts chapter 3 or 4? Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. You can only give what you have. If you've, if you've been under a carnal ministry and all you have is that, that shallow carnal ministry, you're never going to really help anybody. You might impress people. You might pack a stadium out because they, people like that. They like the music and they like the muscles and they like the tight jeans and they like that. But that isn't real ministry. Amen? Come on, give the Lord a hand clap if you believe that. Get a haircut. Dress classic. Look good when you get up there. You're representing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen? Get up there and look like you're a child of the King. 
if you have a problem sweating, I'm going to let you in on this one here now. Some people sweat right through their clothes. I'm going to give you this here for free. There's a T-shirt called Thompson's Tees. Write that down. I'm not getting paid to tell you this either. Thompson Tees. I'm not a sponsor. But you won't sweat through your coat or your shirt. And, you know, I know I sweat terrible. I sweat thinking about it. When I look at a job, I start sweating thinking how to do it. I sweat just thinking about it. But So Thompson Tees, remember that. And, again, like I said, welcome feedback. Now, I want to talk to you tonight for a little bit. I'm not going to be able to cover all of sermon preparation because tonight was the night where we enroll and get our books and all that. But I want to say this. I could teach you with big words and impress you with things like homiletics, exegesis, hermeneutics, exegetical ideas, you know, all that stuff. But that ain't going to help you. You know what I mean? I'll give you the definition. Homiletics, the art of preaching or writing sermons. Homiletics. You can write that down. The art of preaching or writing sermons, huh? Page 155, homiletics. Exegesis is the critical explanation or interpretation of a text, especially Scripture. Now, that exegesis is a big word, right? All it means is the explanation or interpretation of a text of Scripture. I'm going to give you a saying tonight. You're going to hear this some other time. But listen to this for just a minute. A text without a context is just a pretext. Chew on that for a minute. A text without context is a pretext. You want to write that down. What that means is a pretext is a make-believe definition of a scripture, your opinion of the scripture. You can make it say anything you want. But when you take a text out of the context, it becomes a pretext. In other words, if you just take one verse of Scripture, you can make it say anything you want. If you don't look at the verses prior and you don't look at the verses after and get the context of the Scripture, you are scripturally off. It doesn't matter. You can, it can say whatever it wants. And I'm going to say it again. A text out of context is a pretext. It's make you out. All it is is you're saying something, you can make it say whatever you want. That's why it's important to read the context. Read the chapter before, read the chapter after, and you'll find out what it's talking about, what the real meaning, and that's what exegesis is, the critical explanation or interpretation of a text of Scripture. You find that out by reading the previous verses and reading the ones following. And so that's important to know. And I want to go on a little bit here now. But let me say this tonight. An introduction is the first part of a message. And it would be better, I'm going to give you a little bit of opinion tonight. Don't build your introduction to the last. Because you know more about the subject by the time you've done all your study, save your introduction. What I always do when I finish my whole message, I write one page, my, and I write my whole introduction down. Write it down. You commit it to memory. You get a good idea of what you're talking about, and write your introduction down. And I want to share some things with you. The, there's the introduction is the first part of a sermon, but... The first thing you have to do is prepare spiritually. You need to pray. Let me give you a suggestion. An hour of Bible reading every day will give you enough material for two sermons a week. An hour of Bible reading every day will give you enough sermon or teaching material for two teachings or two sermons a week. So you need to read your Bible every day for an hour. If it's at nighttime, If it's in the morning, if you read half in the morning, half at night, every day read your word. Even though you don't think you're you're remembering it, you don't think you're getting it, you think, well, I don't even remember it. You'll remember it. Your spirit, whatever goes in there, your spirit, the Bible says when you need it, 
God will bring it to your remembrance. So an hour of reading your word every day and time with the Lord praying, an hour of prayer, I'm going to tell you, if you start off with 10 minutes or 15 minutes, you can work your way up, but you need to uh, build up your spiritual man because choosing the text before you have an introduction or before you have uh, a body, three points, or before you have a conclusion, anything, the first thing you need is a text. You have to have a text. And so, firstly, if you pray all the time and you read your word all the time, the best text or the best choice for a sermon is when God gives it to you. And But that don't always happen. When Look, how I know it's God, if I'm reading my Bible and all of a sudden I come to a verse of Scripture and a tear runs down my face, all of a sudden I just feel the Holy Ghost. I said, this is, my, this is my text. God, this is what you want me to share. And so I begin to eat that. And I know that text, I know that story inside out. I read it day and night. I know everything there is to know that I can know about it. And so the first, the best, before you can have an introduction, you have to choose your text. And the text, firstly, would be from God speaking to you. And that comes in prayer, constant reading of your word, and you get a text, or you get a thought. But then sometimes God don't speak to us as plain as he does other times. And so we have to think about, what do the people need? What is the needs of the people? What is our people going through right now? What do they need? And so you think about that, and you, you get a text in that way. And then there's other times when, as preachers and pastors for a long time, we have what's called systematic theology which is the third method that I use. If God ain't speaking, listen, I'm going to tell you something now. I've went to bed at night having to preach Sunday morning, and God ain't talking. And I'm like, you mad at me? <laughs> what did I do? I repent of everything. I'll tithe 15% next week. You know, I'm trying everything. God ain't talking. But, you know, so what I've found to do, I go to bed. I say, okay, God, you ain't talking tonight. See you in the morning. And in the morning, in 15 minutes, God gives me a word. So I just went to bed and just I casting all my care on him because he cares for me. Don't stress about it because he said in the hour that you need it, I'll give it to you. But, you know, so we have God speaks to us. We choose a text through God's speaking to us. We have uh, what's the needs of the people is the next choice. We say what does the people need? You know, when we see our people all going to hell in a handbasket and they're all doing crazy things, then we know we need to deal with that subject. Or then the last is systematic theology. What haven't I preached on? What haven't I, what, I can't figure, after 37 years, I don't know what I haven't preached on. And I said to my pastor one time, I said, Pastor, I was preaching for 25 years. I said, Brother Brown, I said, I've preached the whole entire Bible. He said, start over again. You're still wet behind the ears. I was after 25 years. I said, thanks a lot. I thought I really knowed something. But So now you get your text. Now, your introduction. It can come from many things, but I want to give this to you because I'm going backwards. But stay with me for a minute. I want to find where I want to be at for one second. Yeah. Your scripture. Right. But we're going to talk about this is Christ Church. But illustrations will throw light on the subject, but I want to talk to you about your introduction. Your introduction can be the historical setting, what's going on in the, in the story with this man that's writing this story. What's, what's he dealing with? What's the historical setting? It can be a geographical setting. There was, he was on the mountain over here. You know, there was a river there, or he was in a particular city, or on the way to Damascus. It can be geographical. 
it can be, your introduction can be, uh, you don't want to blow your whole message on your introduction. That's a common mistake. Some people, when they get up there to introduce the subject, they blow their whole entire message and they have nothing left to give after that. But your introduction should do just that, introduce the subject. And so it shouldn't be the whole entire message. But the introduction is very important because, like I said, it will grab people's attention and they'll want to listen to the rest of the message. But the introduction is one of the very most important parts of the message because either you get their attention from the beginning or the chances are you're not going to get it later on. You know what I mean? If they don't... If you don't grab their attention in the beginning, then chances are you're not going to get it later on. So you introduce your subject. Now, uh, let's go back to the book for a minute now. What is preaching? Preaching is the proclamation of good news of salvation. Page 155. From man to man. Two elements, a man and his message. Much of what is heard today is not preaching, it's politics, it's popular authors, it's psychology, is not preaching. The preacher is separated by God for the specific work of preaching the gospel. He takes in the truth from God and gives it to men. He must be called to this job. you got to be called to be a preacher. 1 Corinthians 2 and 4, make your calling and election sure. You can teach a parrot to talk, but he is not a preacher. A preacher preaches. Pretty simple, huh? We got a lot of people that carry cards in the ministry, but they never preach. But a preacher preaches. He must be a godly man or woman that lives separated unto God, a holy person, and of great character. He must be interesting and have a good personality, not a robot but a real man, a good man, full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Look at Acts chapter 11 with me, verse 24. Acts chapter 11, verse 24. And when I say a man, I mean a woman or a man. I, I believe women are called to preach the gospel as much as men are, so I'm not Knocking the women. It's talking about Barnabas. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. So he was a good man. He was full of the Holy Ghost and faith. So a man of God, a preacher or a woman of God, has to be a good person, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. Choice of a text. The word text comes from the Latin word textus or textum meaning something woven or spun. It is that which a sermon is woven, the basis of a sermon or message. It is not a point of departure. You know what it means, a point of departure? Listen, some people grab a verse of Scripture, and it's a point of departure. In other words, they dive in the water, and they never surface again until the message is over with. You know what I'm saying? They just, it's just a point of departure. It's really not a text. They don't stay. See, the text is woven. That's what the word textum. Text comes from textum. It's woven throughout the message. That's the point of, I like notes. We should have notes so we don't go off chasing rabbits where the people don't know what we're talking about. So that's what a text is. It's not a point of departure diving in and surfacing at the end, but it's what the message is woven about. They stay on track, stay with the subject. You weave all the way through, and you come out, and your subject is still the same. And that way there, people know what you're talking about. When you ramble all day long and you're on 50 different subjects, they, they walk away. I heard this. I wrote this down. There was a man that said to his deacon, a pastor, he, after he preached his Sunday sermon, he said, do you know that I didn't have no idea what I was going to preach on this morning? 
he was all proud of himself, you know. And the deacon said, do you know that none of the people had any idea when you got done what you was preaching about? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because he just had a point of departure. He dove in, and that was it until he surfaced at the end. And so we need to not make a text a pretext, but it needs to be in context, and it needs to be woven throughout the message. It's not a point of departure. Why a good text? It awakens the interest of the audience. I wonder what will get out of the text. It gains the confidence of the audience because it's God's word. Can I give you a little something? Listen now. Bring your Bible when you're going to preach or teach. Don't bring your iPad. People recognize this as God's word. People understand this is the Holy Bible. They don't understand the iPad. You can st I got an iPad. I told you I study with it, all that, and that's good. But it'll fail you too. I was with a guy. He was preaching in a revival with me, and his iPad whacked out on him and all of his notes and everything, and he was standing like Mr. Magoo because, you know, if you had your notes and you had your Bible, you can always have that. So bring your Bible and listen, preachers, when you come to church, bring your Bible to church. Man, that's the most best gift God gave us besides salvation is the Word of God. Can you say amen? So bring it with you. Come on, hallelujah to God. Reverence the Word. And so we see it's God's Word so you get the confidence of the audience. A lot of people, when you're reading off an iPad, they don't know that you're actually reading God's Word. If you're reading off an app, they don't even know that you're reading God's Word. They think you're like into some storybook, you know what I mean? But when you open up God's Word and they see that, the visual, they have more respect for you when you share the Word of God. And so it also, a good text gives the preacher boldness and authority. And it keeps the preacher's mind from wandering. Pick a text and stay with it. Now, I like, and I, I could teach you, and we will go through some of this, expository preaching, uh, textual preaching, and topical preaching. Three different types of preaching. But like a top, let me give you just a quick, and we'll get into this later, but like topical. Pick a topic, any topic. The anointing. You can take scriptures throughout the Bible and preach on the anointing. It's a topic. You pick that. Water baptism. You preach on water baptism. You can go anywhere through the Bible where water baptism is, and you can preach that topic. You can give me one word, blood. I can go through the Bible and preach you a message on the blood, all the different things about the blood of Jesus Christ. And so that's topical preaching. You take a topic. But expository preaching is my favorite. When you take a story and you lift the truth out of the story, you know, and and people like a story. They're in the, they're in the story with you. You know, they they can see it. You know, uh, Elijah and the prophet to Baal. You know, they're they're with you. You know, when they call down fire from heaven, or David and Goliath, when this giant come up twelve feet tall, little David took his sling and bang hit him in between the eye. They can see that. I like expository preaching. Topical preaching is good if you want to teach like systematic theology. It's good for that. And textual preaching is similar to uh, expository, but I like expository preaching. But anyway, firstly, you choose a text. And I'm going to show you the other types of preaching. But first, choose a text. How to choose a text. Prayer and communion with God every day and reading God's Word, one hour a day of reading, should provide a preacher with enough material for two sermons. Like I shared with you earlier, get a revelation or a burden from God about the message. That's the best way. If you spend time in prayer with God, how about this one? I ain't too bright. One night I go to sleep, and I'm standing on a battlefield in my dream. And chariots are coming this way, and chariots are coming that way, and I'm in the middle of them. I'm going to get run over. And finally... I see Samuel the prophet, and he spoke to King Saul because King Saul was supposed to kill all the Amalekites and kill the king and take nothing, and he kept the king alive, and he took all the cattle and the sheep and everything. 
And Samuel said, obedience is better than sacrifice. And right then and there, I wasn't too bright, but all night long, this I, I would start this dream, and then I would end this dream all night. I'd be in this middle of this field. The chariots would come. Then Samuel would come. Then Samuel would chop off the head of King Agag. Then all start all over again. And I wasn't too bright, but that was Saturday night. I said, guess what? I'm preaching on Sunday morning. You know what I mean? So if God will speak to you in a dream, God can speak to you in your spirit. God can speak to you as you're reading your word. A tear will run down your eye. Or all of a sudden, something will leap in your spirit. Say, this is the message. You'll know that's the message, and you'll preach it. But let me go on. And then I shared with you, second choice is what are the needs of the people? From visiting and fellowshipping, you might see a need, or just from just the, what's going on in the town, you might come up with an idea that our people need this or that. Like, you know, Charles Spurgeon, when England was being bombed, by the Germans, and Scotland was being bombed by the Germans in World War II. Charles Spurgeon, and he had a protege on the other side of London. His name was Joseph Parker, and they was two contemporaries. And they preached a lot of encouraging messages because the people was being bombed by the Germans, and they needed hope. And so sometimes it might be something like that. Our country could be in a national crisis. We was in a national crisis with the COVID, and our people needed hope. They needed to know there's a way out. They need to know God's not going to leave us here. God hasn't deserted us. And we need to have that in mind so we have an idea what the people's needs are. And then I shared with you, thirdly, systematic theology. When you're pastoring for a while, you're going to have to say sometimes, what haven't I preached on? But let me give you something here. Remember this, preachers, teachers. When you keep your notes, I've got notes for 37 years. i got a hope chest full of them. And to me, they're invaluable. I mean, they're my life. One day, I'll give them to Richie or some of you. But I have sermons, thousands of sermons in this thing. And some days when I need a message and I'm really struggling, I can go back to a message 30 years ago. You don't know it. You weren't even born then. You know what I'm saying? So I can go back there. I don't have to reinvent the wheel. But now I can see more revelation on that message, and I can add it's going to get better. Your message will get better and better and better. Every time you preach it, don't think, oh, I preach. I had a guy tell me one time, I've never preached the same message twice. He said, you're a liar. I said, don't tell me that. Or I had a guy tell me, you preached my message. I said, don't bother me. You preach Paul's message. You know what I'm saying? So let me tell you something. So we need to realize, and again, this point I'm going to give you, you're not going to get this nowhere. Right on the top of that message when you preached it and where. Or you'll go back to that same church and they'll think you only know one message. This is the only message he knows. He preached this the last time he was here. On the top of my notes, on every message that I preach, I put right up there. I, when I was at Bill Hicks the other day, Easy way for me to remember is Bill Hicks. So I just put Bill Hicks and the date. I preach it at Bill Hicks, the uh, unlimited God, boom. You know, I'll tell you another one I do, to be honest with you. This is just humorous to me. If a message bombs, I put a cherry bomb on the top of it. Don't ever preach that one again. It's just stunk. You know what I mean? So this is just me. I got my own little note. I look down and say, oh, leave that one alone. You bombed on that one, Parker. And we all bomb. Remember that. Everybody bombs. You know what it is? God shows you sometimes, this is how great you are without me. Mr. Homiletical Harry. This is how wonderful you are with all your hermeneutics and your exegesis and all that. When I don't show up, all your hermeneutics and homiletics and exegesis, right out the window. That's why I tell you, your spiritual preparation is far more important than your scriptural preparation. Listen, I know guys that ain't maybe great at crafting a sermon, but they're in prayer all the time, and they're anointed. And when they stand in the pulpit, the anointing's there. 
and when and they can't, and, and their sermon to me is like boggles my mind. Where is he on about? You know, and they give an altar call and everybody gets saved. I'm like, he was off scripturally. His exegesis stunk, and his homiletical idea was nowhere near normal. But I know one thing, he's in prayer. That's more important. Because if not, if you get mechanical and you rely on an old message or something like that and, and you, can, you can have all the great notes and Greek and Hebrew and you can know everything about the story inside and out and you forget to pray and fast, you really want the anointing when you go someplace? Push the plate aside and say, you know what, I'm going to fast for this meeting and I'm going to pray because I can't afford to get there and flop with all these people looking at me. And God's relying on me. There's a special anointing when you set apart for God and you pray and you fast and you seek his face and you shun the wrong and do the right. You get a special anointing. So we choose a text. Don't choose a text that's over your head. I wrote this down on the top of the next page. Small ships stay close to shore. Don't talk about the millennial reign and the abomination of desolation if you're a small ship. You don't even know where you're at. How about John 3.16? For God so loved the world. That's pretty good stuff. You know, stay simple. You know, there's a saying in preaching that some of the use in the colleges, kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. You know what I mean? So that's pretty easy to remember. Kiss. Keep it simple, stupid, because if you choose a text too big, and another thing about your introduction, don't promise more than you can deliver in your introduction. If your introduction is so fantastic, they're just waiting for the dead to be rose, and everybody's just going to get healed. They're all going to, blind's going to see, you know. And here you are, and you shot your whole wad in the introduction. Now you got nothing left in the tank, you know. So don't let your introduction promise more than you can deliver. And don't choose a text too big for you. Small ships stay close to shore. Are you with me? I don't know how much time I got left, but I promise you, I'll have you, give me another half hour. We started late tonight and uh, with the enrollment and getting the books passed out. But just stay with me for a little bit longer, and I'll try to close. The preacher should know his theme. The preacher should know his theme thoroughly, not that he should know everything about the theme, but he should have a clear, definite, intelligent, masterly grasp on the subject. You ever notice Pastor Billy, he can... I don't know how he does it. He, like, knows the whole entire Bible. For his age, he, he's got a way better memory than I do for Scripture. I mean, he, 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 and, he, and he knows the story, and I, and I listen to him to see if he's accurate, you know, and he knows the real story. I mean, he's actually accurate. So, I mean, the thing of it is, that's because he studied to show himself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed. So when you, like, if you're going to preach on David and Goliath, read it 50 times. Know everything about it. Know it inside and out so that you're not chained to your notes. You can make room for the Holy Ghost. Always make room for the Holy Ghost. People that are chained to their notes, they, they never have the anointing that people have the freedom. Know your main points, but stay unchained to your notes. Oh, here we go. He should have a definite aim where he is going and he must preach with an end in view. All right, remember this. When you start a message, where am I going? What is my purpose? If you don't have that end in view, you're not going to accomplish nothing. You have to have the end in view. Am I preaching for the salvation of the lost? Make sure you have that end in view. Am I preaching for the, for the backslider to come home? Make sure you have that end in view. Make sure that you know where you're going and keep on target, not rambling. you got to aim at something and hit it 
and then fire again. He should aim at a mark, hit it, stop, see what he hit, and then fire another. Where that says five another, it's really fire another. Listen to this now. This is a good statement. You can underline this. Letters not addressed or wrongly addressed are sent to the dead letter office. You get that? Letters not addressed or wrongly addressed are sent to the dead letter office. In other words, if you don't have an end in view, if you're not going somewhere, your message is going to go to the dead letter office. It ain't going to help nobody. When you prepare your message, you have your introduction, you have your body, you have your conclusion. Put plenty of time into your conclusion. And listen, don't be afraid if they don't come down at your first appeal, don't let that stop you from a second one or a third one or whatever. Because the Bible says, Jesus said, compel them to come in. You know what that word compel means? Force them. So don't be afraid. You know, I'm going to tell you something. A lot of preachers nowadays, and I hate this, are, are not having an altar call. These churches that are woke churches and these churches that are um, seeker sensitive, we got one right down at the end of the road. A guy that comes to our church, his son's a pastor. He comes here. Well, you know, I said to him, he went to visit down there. He's been coming here for 16 years. I said, pay attention next time you go down to visit your son's church down there. They don't give an altar call, I'll guarantee it. He came back to me, he said, you know what? They don't give an altar call. I said, yeah. He said, you know why I'm here? I said, why? He said, you're the only church around here preaching the gospel. I said, yeah, well, that's a good thing. But let me tell you something. It's not giving an appeal or not going somewhere. It's like spreading out a prime rib dinner Yorkshire pudding, cream corn, mom's English trifle for at the end there, and all this good stuff, and then say, look at it, but don't eat. Don't taste it. And that's what it is when you don't give an altar call. Some people are afraid to give an altar call because they're afraid they're not going to get the result that they want. Let me share something with you. The result is not your department. You can't heal nobody. You can't save nobody. You can't deliver nobody. All you are is a messenger boy. You just do your job, and you just do what God told you to do. Just put it out there, and just stick with it, and God will bless it. Can you say amen? Give my hand clap. Hallelujah. And so we see a young preacher... <laughs> Listen to this. A young preacher once expressed his sorrow to Mr. Spurgeon. Mr. Spurgeon, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, was known as the Prince of Preachers. Now, he was a Baptist man, but in fairness to him, he believed in living the life. He believed in once saved, always saved, but he also believed in living the life. Now, if you live the life, you are saved forever. You understand what I'm saying? So he had balance, but he wasn't a Holy Ghost man. But this young preacher said to Mr. Spurgeon, he said, there's been very few conversions in his meetings, and Mr. Spurgeon asked him a question. You don't expect salvations at every service, do you? And he said, oh, no, the young man said. And Mr. Spurgeon replied, then you certainly won't have any. If you don't expect people to get saved, if you don't expect people to get healed, if you don't expect people to get delivered, then it won't happen. This young man, he said, very few people's getting saved in my meetings. And Spurgeon said, you don't expect people to get saved every service, right? Oh, no, he said. Well, he said, then it won't happen. See, so that's the way it is. We have to believe that the Word of God will accomplish that what it's sent out to do, and it won't come back void. Amen. Speak the Word. And sixthly, now this is part of your study now. I'm going to give you a little information. You're gathering sermon material. Let me say this to you. I want to share something with you. You see these tracks? I brought these tracks for a reason. These are what I call sermon starters, okay? When you're struggling for a message, here's one here. Amazing Grace, right? 
All the scriptures, amazing love, amazing life, amazing position, amazing peace, amazing gifts, amazing salvation. Here's a book here. Let me share something with you. This is a, a men's devotional book, right? That's a sermon shrunk down, text, points. You can take, if you find a good subject that you feel would be good for your people, you expand that. You take that message that's been shrunk down to three little points, and you make three big points, and you've got a whole message here. So these are what I call sermon starters. Here's one here. Look at this here. Romans Road to Salvation, right? Everything for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is is eternal life to Jesus Christ our Lord. All right. Uh, Romans 5 and 8. But God commended his love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Romans 10, 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the Romans road to salvation. Basic gospel message right here in this tract. And there's a lot of good ones like that. All through, you can go through every one of these. Give thanks. There's a message on thanks. Thanks for my food. Thanks for Jesus. Thank you for my friends. Thank you for God's favor. And so there's a lot of ways, you know, that you can find sermons and you can gather sermon material. Now, let me give you a little pointer. If you got a recorder, a nice recorder. Some nights I'm laying in my bed, and you'll get this happen to you, and you'll get the greatest revelation. You'll get a whole sermon download, and you say, I'll write it down in the morning. Tomorrow morning, it's gone. Forget that. That's in Never Never Land. But if you stop right then and just record your main thoughts of what God's just downloaded on you right now, then tomorrow... You can dig on that, and you can amplify, and you can study that, and you'll have a great message. Or you can write it down with a notepad, whatever you want to do. But I have a little recorder. Let me give you another point. If you want to learn to memorize Scripture, like there's a recorder. I have this recorder with a set of earphones, and it takes a three-minute or a one-minute continuous play take. Now listen to me for a minute. And I read it in my in the voice that I'm going to quote it in with authority, with a power. I, I speak it. I'm reading it from the Bible. I speak it into the recorder, in my voice, into the recorder, right? So now it's going to continually play my voice quoting that whole chapter, like the Ten Commandments. I learn that stuff like that. But then I put the recorder in my, the, the headphones in my ears, and I go to bed. And when I wake up in the morning, the whole chapter has been downloaded in my brain, in my computer. And now I have that whole chapter memorized. I have that whole story memorized. And so get you a little recorder. You can buy them. I bought mine over here at Best Buy. It's about that wide and about that long. And it takes a little tape. Or, or my new one don't have a tape. It actually just, there's no tape. It's a continuous play. And you can learn and you can use it for other things. You can use it for gathering sermon material. But you need to, like how I do a message, I'm writing stuff down on different pieces of paper, right? I got paper. You wouldn't look at them and you'd say, this is like Chinese fortune cookies here, you know? I got papers everywhere, you know what I mean? I got seven Bibles, papers everywhere, you know? But then I start to sift through and I take this out, I start to arrange it, I put it together, and then it becomes a message. And that's what you got to do. You firstly, you choose your text, gather sermon material, start putting your points together. I'm going to, I'd like to show you sometime, but I won't be able to do it this week, how the different outlines and how to put them together, because we're running out of time. I'm sorry I didn't mean to keep you so long, but I hope I didn't bore you. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap. 
I'm going to read the rest of this, this page, though. A good, a good arrangement. A good arrangement is of vital importance. Let me say this to you. It's like I preach a message on the prodigal son, okay? If you have a good illustration that are they're worth their weight in gold or a good story, as you grow in the Lord and as you have life's experiences, you'll, you'll use your own life. you use your own experiences, things that you saw. I'll give you a for instance. I was over here on old Route 9. I know the guy over there that pumped all the cement in the, in the casinos in uh, Atlantic City. And he's always got a coffee stain and a piece of tobacco out of his mouth. You wouldn't think he had a dime. He's a multimillionaire, but he's been a friend of mine for years. And I go there, and he's got a hired man that lives on his place. He lives right on nine off of the water, back. You would never know he's back there. But he's got all these concrete pumper trucks. And he's got this hired man that's been with him that I know of for 40-some years. And he's got a junkyard dog on a chain that's flipping on this, on this tow chain. And he's bit this hired man he told me 17 times over the years. Now, he's on a 10-foot chain. I said, why in the world do you get close enough? You know he's got this much chain, and you get close enough to let him bite you. And that's an illustration I use with people. Like, people know they've been bit by that dog before. They know, and they get into that same thing again. They fall for it again. And, and the illustrations... You know, like when I preach about the prodigal son, I tell you this story, and I won't charge you for it. You can use it. Anything I have, freely I have, freely I give you. So use it. But, you know, I read a story, and I'll tell you who wrote the story. It was um, uh, the man that wrote the uh, uh, the fisherman story. Anyway, uh, what was his name? The famous writer, Ernest Hemingway. He wrote the story. He said, in Madrid, Spain, I'm giving you a, an illustration to close. Use your illustration to close if you have a good one, to bring it to a conclusion, to draw a point of what you're talking about. It drives the point home. And so he said, in Madrid, Spain, there was a man had a son. They argued. They fell out. The son wanted to be a bullfighter. He, he ran away from home. And afterwards, the father felt bad because he was fighting with his son. He said, most of the bullfighters die, son. He said, without any training, you're going to die. And he said, I'm going to be a bullfighter. I'm going I'm to do what I want. He left home. So his father was brokenhearted about a week later. So he went downtown to Madrid, Spain, and, and he wrote, got in the newspaper office of the, the Liberal News, and he wrote an article. He said, Dear Paco, all is forgiven. Meet me at the Hotel Montana, 12 o'clock in the afternoon on Tuesday. Love, Papa. And he said, he went down there 12 o'clock Tuesday to the Hotel Montana, downtown Madrid, and there was 800 Pacos had gathered for forgiveness that needed somebody to show them love and forgiveness. Everybody in the world is looking for love and forgiveness. And we can close with a message, with, a, with an illustration and drive the point home, and we can... And people know what I, the prodigal son, what happened. The father was there with open arms saying, come on, son. He didn't hold it against him. I love you. Put a ring on his hand. Put a robe on his back. Put shoes on his feet. Kill the fatted calf. This is my boy that was dead, but now he's alive. He was lost, but now he's found. Come on, give Jesus a hand clap of praise. And so, I'm going to stop, but every good and finished sermon has three parts, an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. I'm going to get into more of that. I'm going to teach you next week some examples. Of, I'll show you how to listen. Once you know this formula, you'll know how to look at a verse, and you'll see the, the points in the verse. Or you'll see the points in the story. And you'll know how to, your introduction could be the verses before, the, the, the you know, what, what's going on in, in the time, in the day, the hour. And then you'll know how, like for instance, Philippians 4.13, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering 
and being made conformable unto his death. All right, there's four points in one verse. Psalms 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, nor standeth in the way of sinners. Three points there. There's a progression. He's standing, he's sitting, or he's standing. He, 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 it goes all the way down the line. But anyway, there's all through Scripture, like anything, there's a formula. And once you learn the formula, you can find the points in a, in a, a, a text that you can lift off the page, and then you can come up with the introduction, the conclusion, an illustration to drive it home. But your main thing is, it's like this. And I'll show you next week because we're out of time. It's a, I'll put a skeleton up there. You put the meat on the bones. If I put a skeleton, once I show you, there's different types of preaching. But I think the easiest one for us to understand, and I think is an introduction, three points, and a conclusion. And it makes it nice because if you're really a polished preacher, let's say this here for instance. I can introduce my three points in the beginning, and I'll prick their interest, right? In other words, I'll give you for instance, look in your Bible, I mean in your book, page 161, real quick. I'm going to stop with this, but I just want to give you a, a little skeleton. And you know the story, the text, I know your works and your labor and your patience. Now, there's three points in there. What was our first love? He tells them, you lost your first love, right? He's preaching to them. I have one thing against you. You've left your first love. He said, you've done some things right. I know your works. I know your patience. But nevertheless, I have one thing against you. You've left your first love. One, here it is. What was my first love? How did I lose it? And how do I get it back? See there? That's a formula. What was my first love? My first love was when I fell in love with Jesus. I met him one day and he changed my life. I met him one day, I was an alcoholic and he set me free. I met him one day, I was a drug addict and he changed my life. I was on the road, bleeding and dying on the Jericho Road and he came along and he poured in the oil and the wine. And, and many people that have never been saved, you fell. How did you lose it? You fell in your father, Adam. You fell when Adam and Eve fell. You fell in the garden. Men, all men are sinners. Every man needs a Savior. How did I lose it? I lost it in the garden when Adam and Eve fell. Man was separated from God. How do I get it back? Jesus came to bridge the gap that you and I can be born again by the Spirit of God. Can you say amen in Jesus' name? So we see. There's a formula. What was my first love? How did I lose it? It can apply to the backslider, and it can apply to all mankind. Because everybody lost it when Adam fell. And everybody lost it in the garden. But we can get it back if we repent. And Jesus is waiting. You know, it's, I wrote this down in the one note here. I got this off of Glow Stewart, if you're watching, Jackie. She taught a message to the ladies one time, and she used a bottle of shampoo, and it said, repeat again if necessary. You know what I mean? Sometimes we get off the road. Sometimes we get messed up. Sometimes we can drift away, and we got to repeat again the blood of Jesus Christ.